Brook Church, how are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. A uh, special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. As we get going this morning, I'd like to just say thank you to everyone uh, who reached out to our family over this last week. For those of you who maybe didn't hear, uh, Becky's dad passed away last weekend, and so we were kind of out of pocket for about half of this week with the family, getting the funeral together. And so we've had many, many people who have reached out, who have sent meals, who have sent cards, who have expressed their prayers, concerns, and condolences. And so we're just really, really grateful for that. So it's really encouraging to be a part of a community that cares for one another so well. So thank you for all your support. Uh, and I, I'm really excited to be back today, uh, a l- little anxious. Uh, there's this thought going through my head. It's like, do I still know how to do this? Is this going to work out all right? Or is this going to be uh, a bit of a disaster? So we'll, we'll find out. Um, I want to get going by telling you um, a little story about this woman named Hannah. This is Hannah Up. Um, and in 20, 2008, she was 23 years old. She was a recent college grad and was on her second year of teaching at an elementary school in an underserved neighborhood in Harlem in New York City. And everyone who interacted with her, everyone who worked with her, always said the same things about her. She was kind, she was compassionate, she was so present with people. Anytime um, a friend would walk away from a conversation, they would feel as though Hannah was their best friend. She just treated everybody so kind and lovingly. And she loved her students and always went the extra mile to support and, and care for her students. And in 2008, it was the first day of school, And her class walked into a classroom without a teacher. And Hannah that morning didn't show up for school. She didn't call in. She didn't line up a sub. She didn't let anyone know she wasn't going to be there. She just simply disappeared. And her disappearance that day started a three-week search throughout New York City trying to find her. Now, Anytime a student or a teacher doesn't show up on the first day of school, like that would be unusual and a little problematic. But for Hannah, it was deeply troubling because of how much she cared for her students. People just couldn't imagine why she was gone. And so over the next couple of weeks, the whole city was on alert looking for this young woman. Now at that time, the metro area of New York City was almost 20 million people. And they're looking for this one young woman. Talk about trying to find a needle in a haystack. But miraculously, a few days after her disappearance, she was spotted on a surveillance footage from an Apple store somewhere in Manhattan. And so naturally, the search for her started to zero in in the community around where that Apple store was. And then a few weeks, a few days later after that appearance on the surveillance footage for Apple, she showed up in a Starbucks. And at this point, people were starting to see her image posted around and on the news. And so somebody called the police saying, hey, she's here. But before the police could get there, Hannah slipped out the back door, which started to raise question and some suspicion. Is she missing or is she running and hiding? Over the course of the next few weeks, she was spotted five times at five different athletic clubs throughout the city And then 20 days after her initial disappearance, she was found in the Hudson River floating face down. It was the Staten Island Ferry captain who was just doing his job, who spotted her, noticed she was face down, and instantly went into rescue protocol mode and thought she was dead. But when he pulled her from the water, she miraculously started to breathe and was alive. So naturally, they rushed her to a hospital and in an ambulance, and by the time she got there, she was starting to come to. And after a series of tests, they came to learn that she suffers with a rare form of amnesia called dissociative fuge. People who who suffer from this disorder, when they enter into these fuge states, can't recall anything about themselves. They don't know their identity. They don't know their life story. Sometimes people who suffer with this form of amnesia create a new identity, create a new story. But for Hannah, there was no evidence that she had assumed any sort of identity. She just didn't know who she was in those 20 days. Some people call this the Jason Bourne syndrome. If you've ever watched the the Bourne identity movies, she just completely didn't know who she was. She wandered New York City for almost three weeks without any recollection of who she was, where she lived, what she did for a living, or anything 
about her at all. And I wonder if anybody here this morning can at some level resonate with that story, not because you have this rare form of amnesia, but because there are times, and maybe you're in one of those seasons, where you find yourself saying, yeah, I don't know who I am. Like, I don't, I, deep in my being, deep in my soul, I don't know who I am or where I belong or how I fit in this world. And what her story illustrates is that without a strong sense of identity, your life can easily turn into shambles. It's a strong sense of identity that is crucial to guiding you through life because without it, life can feel like a barren wilderness. Without a strong sense of identity anchoring you and grounding you, you can be adrift, you can be isolated, you can be alone, you can find yourself in great danger where the greatest thing you can do is just simply survive. And the results of a life without a strong identity can be detrimental. So over the course of her life, Hannah had two other episodes, uh, one in 2014 and then the other one in 2017. In 2017, she was living in the Virgin Islands. She was a teacher at a Montessori school, and that was the same year that Hurricane Irma ripped through the Caribbean. And it turned this little island upside down, destroyed and devastated everything that was there. And what made matters worse was that two weeks later, like Hurricane Maria was coming through. And so after Hurricane Irma passed and everybody was realizing there's another one coming, people were saying, should we leave the island? Should we stay? A bunch of people were fleeing. And Hannah said, no, I'm going to stay because I'm going to ready this school along with a few other teachers and prepare for it for the second hurricane so that it can be a place of refuge for people in the area, for students when they return. We need this school. So for the next two weeks, she started to prepare and ready the school. And one day, she just didn't show, which was so surprising to everybody who was there. And naturally, people started to scour the island, knowing that she had this history. And what they found wasn't her, but they found some belongings of hers. They found her car parked at a beach parking lot. She was known to be a swimmer and oftentimes would go out and swim for exercise. They found some clothes of hers, maybe a sundress that she was wearing before she went swimming, a cell phone and some keys, and it was thought that she entered into one of these fuge-like states again, went out for a swim, and never came home. See, when you don't know who you are, the results can be devastating. The results can be detrimental. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're like, yeah, I'm in one of those seasons too. Maybe there's been transition in your life. Maybe something has changed in your life, and you find yourself sitting in an uncomfortable situation where you're like, I have no idea who I am. If that's you this morning, our passage in Luke 4 speaks to who you are at your core. Now, maybe you are here this morning, and you're like, but I know who I am. I have this strong sense of identity. What our passage also illustrates this morning is that even if you think you have this strong sense of who you are, that identity, if it's rooted in the wrong place, can be fragile and easily tested. But at its core, this passage reminds us where we need to look and to whom we need to look to find our true sense of identity. This is how our passage begins. This is Luke 4, starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, in this moment, Jesus is in transition, right? It says he just left the Jordan, which is a reference to the Jordan River, and the place he is headed is the desert. And and notice the contrast of these two locations. If we can go back to the Jordan River, like look at the picture of, this is a picture of the Jordan River, how green and lush it is. I mean, you just look at it and you're like, oh, there's life, there's vitality, things are growing. It's like, oh, yes, there's life there. Contrasted with the desert, which is desolate, which is dusty, which is marked by death. Jesus is leaving the Jordan and he's going to the wilderness. Now, 
whenever the wilderness is mentioned in the scriptures, it isn't just referencing the geography of that area. It usually also represents something else. Now, sometimes the wilderness represents a place of prayer, retreat, and devotion. Like you see in, in Luke 5, in Luke 5 verse 16, it says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. In Greek, the original translation of the New Testament, that word for lonely is the same Greek word used for wilderness. You could translate this verse, Jesus often went and withdrew to the wilderness to pray. Sometimes the wilderness is representing prayer, devotion, and spiritual retreat. And, and you might actually think that's what's happening here. Because twice in verse 1, it says that Jesus, full of the Spirit, right? And Jesus was led by the Spirit. There are two references to the Holy Spirit when Jesus moves out into the wilderness. And you think to yourself, oh, Jesus must be going to the wilderness for a retreat and to pray. And, and maybe that's the case. But not only is the wilderness representing spiritual retreat at times, oftentimes the wilderness represents chaos. It represents isolation. It's a place where demons and the devil are at work. It's a place where people go and are tested. Our, our minds, if we know the Old Testament, will naturally go back to the book of Exodus, where the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and were continually tested as to whether or not they were going to trust and follow God or follow their own way of life. And here we read that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, verse 2, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now, part of what I'm hoping to do today is just kind of share some reflections from my sabbatical. If you're new, if this is your first time, I was granted a sabbatical. This is my first week back from uh, that time, first sermon back, and I thought it would be appropriate to share a few things about what God revealed to me on our sabbatical. And, and I wouldn't necessarily have characterized my sabbatical as a wilderness season with chaos and demons lurking, although we did do a 10-day RV trip, and about four days in, you could have convinced me that demons <laughs> possessed my kids, right? Like, you could have convinced me. But, but on the whole, it was a really restful time. Becky and I had the opportunity to go to England for 10 days. And one of the phrases we used as we were on that trip is that we are going to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. We're just going to enjoy our time. We're not going to be on a tight schedule. We're just going to let this trip be what it is. And we're not going to hurry our way through it. We're just going to rest. And really, I would say that was true of the majority of my sabbatical. There was one Tuesday... We were here in town, and I went to the grocery store, and I was like, this is the best trip to the grocery store I've ever done. It's a Tuesday at 2, and I started to think about the things I would normally be doing on a Tuesday at 2, and I'm like, I'm just going to go to the store and get some ice cream and some things that we need for the week, and I'm just going to enjoy this leisure trip. So, so there was a whole lot of rest during our sabbatical. But, but there were also things that surfaced in my heart that surprised me. Because when you have a season of life where your normal routine is changed and you have space created in your life, it's natural that things in your heart are going to start to come to the surface and then you at some level have to wrestle with them. Now, I was a little worried because I thought that maybe my sabbatical would be a wilderness season because so often it's easy for pastors, including myself, to draw their sense of identity from what they do, from the church that they lead, from the weekend, week out preaching that happens to say, this is who I am. And people were coming up to me the month before saying, are you excited? Are you eager? And truth be told, I was nervous. I was anxious because I'm an approval junkie. Because I love when people say nice things about me and to me. And I was worried that I was going to be like an addict going through withdrawals all summer saying like, I need to get my fix for people to tell me how wonderful I am, right? So I was anxious about it. Now, fortunately, that didn't happen. I was really able to settle in and rest. But as I did that, certain things started to come to the surface of my heart that I had to really wrestle with and be honest with, with regards to who I am and where I get my sense of identity from. And so while Jesus here is tested three times 
um, and they will call it tempted, I too felt like there were three tests that came my way that mirror the three temptations of Jesus. And so this is what we read in verse 2. This is Jesus' first temptation. This is his first test. It says, He ate nothing during those 40 days, and at the end of him he was hungry. So the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. So Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days, hasn't eaten anything, been fasting that whole time. He comes to the end, and sure enough, he is hungry. And it's probably not just that he's hungry. He's probably craving something. He's probably had a certain meal on his mind for the second half of those 40 days. He's probably craving a barbecue lamb shake, right? With sweet and creamy pomegranate sauce, lemon, herb, couscous, fresh baked flatbread, and a nice big glass of red wine. Like he's like, oh, I can't wait for my first meal. And the devil comes along to him in his place of craving and says, hey, just take these stones, turn them into bread. You have the power to do it. You are able, so why don't you? What the devil is doing here is he's playing off of Jesus' desire, not just his craving, but his desire. He's hungry. He hasn't eaten for 40 days and he just wants something to eat. He's playing off Jesus' desire. The first temptation is desire. And this isn't anything new. Like when we open the story of Scripture in Genesis 3, it's the first thing that happens to Adam and Eve. We're told in Genesis 3, verse 6, that Adam and Eve are standing by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? They're put in this garden. They're called to steward this garden with God and work alongside him in partnership. And it says that they can eat of the fruit of any tree that they want except for this one tree. And they happen to be hanging around this tree. And the devil shows up as a serpent and starts to talk with Eve and says, Hey, why not? Just give it a bite. What's the big deal? What's it going to hurt? And it says in verse 6 of chapter 3 that Eve saw the fruit of the tree and saw that it was desirable. There was desire that she had. Now, because of this, sometimes we think that desire is wrong. Sometimes we associate desire being sinful because when we give in to desire, it can be really destructive in our lives. But desire in and of itself isn't bad. Like you were created for desire, to desire. You can't not desire. It's just the way that you are hardwired. It's when desire rules your heart and your life that it can become destructive. And what starts to happen, because it's not just with food, it's also with stuff and the things of this world. This belief can start to surface in our heart that I am, as it relates to identity, I am what I have. Like if I have things that are valuable, if I have things that are worthwhile, I am valuable, I am worthwhile, I, I am what I have. And the action associated with that desire is that we naturally start to consume things. We go after things. I am what I have, and so naturally I start to consume. And I actually saw this at work in my life and in my heart while we were on sabbatical. One, one of the things we got to do was go visit some old friends in Atlanta from when we lived there. Uh, we spent a week in Atlanta, then we went to go visit some friends in Tallahassee and eventually made our way to Florida to visit my brother and do a couple days at Disney with the girls but what I found when we were staying in Atlanta, we stayed with two friends, two families that are friends of ours, and, and, and both the husbands of these families. One was a COO of a large company, the other one was a CEO, and we stayed in their beautiful North Atlanta McMansion homes, right? And as soon as we walked in, it was like, you, I mean, it just like felt like comfort, it felt like wealth, it felt like, oh, this is how people live around here, right? And instantly there was this desire for like, how do I get myself one of these? Like they have rooms where the lights just turn on, right? It's just like, you're just there. And it's like, oh, wow, like things automated. One friend had a couple like muscle cars in the garage that were just his hobbies. Another friend had this beautiful BMW convertible and we rode around in it like kings. And my girls are like, dad, why can't we get one of these, right? But what I found surfacing in my heart was that I was jealous, not of my, not of my friend's car, but of his son's car, right? He's got a 15-year-old son who doesn't even have his license yet and has his own car. Now, you might think, well, mom and dad probably bought him the car, which wasn't the case. He saved up, 
bought it himself, but his car is nicer than my car, right? Like, I am so ready to be done with my car. I want to drive it off a cliff and get a new one for different reasons we still have it. But I'm like, oh, I found myself jealous of my friend's car, right? Which shows us that sometimes we think that the stuff that we have makes us who we are. And when we look at other people's stuff, we think like, oh, if I had that in my life, then my life would be complete. But if we're honest with ourselves and we're thinking rightly with our mind and not with our desire, we know that stuff that we go after, while it's like, oh, it's brand new and it's shiny and it's neat, what happens? It gets old. It breaks. It gets irrelevant. It's out of date. And no longer does that thing have the lure that it once did. And so if you find yourself ruled by desire, you find yourself on an endless hamster wheel of chasing after all of the new and greatest things. And Jesus knows that those sorts of things don't truly satisfy. The danger with desire is that you live with this false belief that if I acquire that one thing, it will make my life complete. But Jesus knows that it won't. And that's why he says, It is written, this is verse 4, man shall not live on bread alone. Responding specifically to what the devil tempts him with, but also responding saying the things of this world won't fully satisfy. It's a recognition that there's something greater than food and stuff that satisfies the desire of our hearts. And so Jesus is first tempted with desire. The second thing that he's tempted with is this. This is verse 5. It says, The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So in the second temptation, the devil is dangling in front of Jesus power and glory saying, all of this will be yours. Now, for many of us, it's, it's pretty rare that power and glory are just handed over to you unless you're an heir of some company or some family or something magnificent. Usually, it's something we have to work for. And the way that it often manifests itself in many of our internal hearts is a drive to achieve. Like, anybody here this morning say that, that you're a driven person? If you're not willing to admit that, would your friends, would your family, would your spouse say they're a driven person, right? Are you somebody who likes to achieve things? Are you disciplined? Do you set a goal? Do you say there's nothing that's going to stop me from accomplishing this goal no matter what it is? I'm like that. I I, I tend to live this way. I do and I do. I like to be productive. I like to get things done. There was one weekend where Becky was gone. She had the kids going to visit her family. I was home alone. And typically, when I have a weekend to myself, like I I do a house project. I got to be productive. I got to achieve something. And I had to have this conversation with myself and with my spiritual director for my sabbatical, like, I should probably do nothing this weekend. And they're like, yep, don't do a thing. So it was like Friday rolls around. I'm like coaching myself, Brian, don't do anything. Like, don't go to Home Depot and buy a new tool to get something done. Don't go ripping things out in the front yard. Just like sit and be. Because I like to do. I like to achieve. I like to step back and be like, look what I have done. Look at, look what I have achieved, right? And so what starts to happen is there's this belief when we live into that mindset or that space that I am what I achieve, right? If the temptation of desire is I am what I have, the temptation around a drive is I am what I achieve. And so the action associated with that belief is that you climb whatever metaphorical ladder you think you need to climb to make yourself worthwhile and significant. And usually what happens is you start to work in that light, not because of joy, not because of calling, not because of fulfillment, but because you believe you have to prove something to somebody. Whether it's yourself, a parent, That one person who said, you will never, and right away you're like, watch me, I will, right? I've got to prove something to somebody. And so along the way, if that drive starts to rule your life, 
you can start to find that you compromise your integrity. You compromise your relationships or your conviction or your overall health just so you can stand on the top and look down at other people and say, I did it, right? But the danger with being on top is twofold. When you get to the top and you realize, no, 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 that's not the top because there's somebody else higher than you. Or you actually do reach the top and there's only one way to go. And that's down, right? So over sabbatical, one of the great things we got to do is visit other churches. We got to go visit different churches in the area. And when we traveled, we went to different churches. And it was a fascinating, wonderful experience. I got to just sit there like you all and be like, ah, I wonder how this is going to go today. Like, what are they going to talk about? I wonder what songs they're going to sing. I can just sit here with my coffee and like, oh, not a care in the world, right? (laughs) But once the service starts, it's like you go into critique mode without even trying. I went to go visit Elmbrook um, and my mom was there. My mom's here this morning and we were listening to their new senior pastor and she's like, so do you have a hard time like not critiquing what he's saying? I'm like, I try not to because I know I shouldn't, but you can't just help but do it because you live in that world. But not only do you critique, you start to compare. And sometimes we went to churches that were were bigger than ours, and I look at the area and the facility, and I listen to the guy speak, and I'm like, he's not any smarter than I am, right? (laughs) He is not any more talented or gifted than me. Like, why does he have a bigger church? Because somehow in our minds, we associate that bigger is better, right? Right? We think that if I lead a bigger thing, that makes me more significant and worthwhile because I am what I achieve. And so God had to continually remind me, like, Brian, it's not about being on the top because once you're at the top, there's only one way to go, and that's down. But it's trusting that the work you're doing is significant, not because you're trying to produce results, but but because you're doing it for the joy of it. You're doing it because you're called to it. You find satisfaction in what it is and the people around you trusting that I'm orchestrating these things and you don't need to work. I have not called you to lead that church. I have called you to lead this church. And so the invitation is to stop climbing and to simply trust God. And at the end of it, the issue here when we're trying to climb to get to the top, it's an issue of misguided worship. Either worship of the success or a worship of self. That's why Jesus says in verse 8, he answers the devil, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Not the success, not yourself, not being on top. So then from there, they go into the third temptation. Jesus is tempted with his desire, with a drive for power and glory. And then lastly, it's this in verse 9. It says, the devil led him to Jerusalem. So there's this move from the wilderness Now they're in the city of Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now, Satan in this moment is being very clever and cunning. And he's actually using Jesus' own strategy against him in this moment. Because if you notice, each time the devil tempts Jesus, he responds with scripture. He says, it is written. That's the first thing that comes out of his mouth. And so the devil throws that back in his face and he says, hey, Jesus, it is written. He's going to try and use, Jesus, or use scripture in his temptation of Jesus. And this is what he says, verse 10, for it is written. He, meaning your father, will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Go ahead, throw yourself off the top of the temple, trusting that your father is going to command angels to guide you down safely so you won't get hurt. He's quoting from Psalm 91. And essentially what he's doing here is he's raising the question to Jesus, who's really in charge? Is it you? Or is your father the one who calls the shots? If it is him, why don't you try and control him, manipulate him? He's putting this opportunity for Jesus to demand something from God. Like if you throw yourself, you can call on this scripture, manipulate him to get, get him to do what you want, and he will guide you safely down. See, the belief is in this moment, I'm significant when I'm in charge. When I have the ability 
to control things. That's the, that's the action associated with this belief. When I'm in control, when I'm in charge, when I can make demands even of God and get him to do what I think he should do, then I know that my life is worth something. And I don't know if you would ever like actually articulate this. I probably wouldn't. But sometimes we try and do that to God, don't we? Maybe we're not barking orders at him in our prayer. Maybe we're not throwing ourselves off a cliff like, God, you got to catch me. But how often do we think God owes us something? He, he owes us something because of our dedication and our service and our faithfulness. And we look at what other people have and you're like, God, that's due to me because of the way I've lived my life. Like, how often do we do that? We, we, we have these demands. We try and manipulate and control God, thinking that if I live in a certain way, he is obligated to give me what I want. And Jesus here in verse 12 says it again. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test, answering again with a word from Scripture. And then at that point, verse 13, the devil knew his time was up. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left until an opportune time. Now, what's really happening here for Jesus in this moment, the thing that's really being tested isn't so much his desire, his drive, or these demands, but it's his identity. It's who he is. Because twice, two of the three temptations, the devil starts by saying, if you are the Son of God, like, if this is who you are, if this is your identity, then. Which means, when we're tempted with desire, when we're tempted with a drive to achieve, when we're tempted to have demands and be in control, we find that there's probably insecurity surfacing in our sense of self and our identity. Meaning when you notice a 15-year-old has a nicer car than you and you begin to grow jealous and insecure, when you find that a pastor has a bigger church than you and you grow critical and compare, and when you think God owes you something because of your dedication to him, you, and by you, I mean me, lose sight of who I am. I lose sight of who I am. That I am not what I do. I am not what I achieve. I am not what I have. I am not when I think I'm in control. I am where I belong. And where do I belong? Where do you belong? The exact same place Jesus belongs. Because the beautiful part of this story is what happens right before it. The end of Luke 3. Like Jesus at this point hasn't done anything ministry-wise. He hasn't preached a sermon. He hasn't performed a miracle. He hasn't called a disciple. The only thing that has happened to him is he has been baptized. It's a passive action. He has been submerged under water. And when he comes up from the water, it says the Holy Spirit comes down on him like a dove. Heaven's open, heaven opens up and a voice calls down to him, This is my Son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Not because Jesus has done anything, achieved anything, done anything. He belongs with the Father. That's his place of belonging. Your identity, first and foremost, isn't about what you do. It's about where you belong. And where you belong and where I belong is the same place where Jesus belongs. And that's with the Father. The same thing said of Jesus is true of you because you are found to be in him. This is my son. This is my daughter. Speaking of all you, whom I love with you, I am well pleased. You could say it this way. It's your belonging that informs and shapes your being. Your belonging shapes your being. Where you think you belong, shapes how you understand who you are. And we belong with God through Jesus because of what he has done, not because of what we do. And here's what's really interesting about this moment. When the devil comes to Jesus and tempts him, he's tempting him with things Jesus already has. When the devil tempts him with desire for food, it should remind us of what Jesus says in John 4 when his disciples say, hey, do you need any food? And he says, no, 
I've got food you don't even know about. Not speaking of physical food, but a spiritual food that he's spiritually nourished and can go without food because he has something greater than food. When the devil tempts him with power and glory, like Jesus already has power and glory because he is the true king of kings over everything. When the devil tempts him with control, Jesus already has control. We're told that he controls things. He holds all things together by his powerful word. He sustains life just through speaking. Jesus already holds things together. And this is the same thing that the devil does with Adam and Eve in the garden. Tempts them. If you eat of this, you will be like God. He's tempting them with what they already have because they already are like God because they're already made in his image. So when you find yourself tempted with desire, with some drive, with some sort of demands that you have to try and acquire something, remember, you already have those things in Christ. That in him is the fullness of all things. And therefore, we can simply rest in him. And know what happens when you rest in your identity? You receive power. Earlier, we said that sometimes in Scripture, the wilderness is a place of retreat. Sometimes it's a place of testing. It's also a place of encounter. We think of Moses in Exodus 3, the burning bush. He sees and encounters God. Where is he? He's in the wilderness at that time by himself. And while we don't see it in this moment that there's a direct encounter with his heavenly father, what we do see in verse 14 is that when Jesus leaves the wilderness, we read this, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He returns with power because he's encountered, encountered God because he's been faithful in the face of testing and temptation. He is basically done for Israel and us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And so when we rest in him, who he is, and find that all of who we are is wrapped up in him, then we can rest and find that power is unleashed and released in and through our lives. And so the question for us this morning is of those three temptations, of those three tests, which do you resonate with the most? And if you're honest with yourself, where and how is your identity at play and wrapped up in those things? Do you believe that you are what you have? Do you believe that you are what you achieve? Do you believe that you're significant when you're in control? And if you do, the invitation is maybe going into this next week, to step into a practice that counteracts that belief, right? So if it's desire, maybe the invitation from God is to fast from something, to to create distance in your life, to remind yourself that that thing shouldn't and doesn't control me or bring the satisfaction that I think it should and would. If it's this desire to achieve and this drive to succeed, maybe instead of trying to do something for yourself, to climb a little higher, It's serving somebody to help them climb a little higher. And if it's control that you seek, it could be that the invitation is to surrender and let go, to put yourself in a place where you have to wrestle with, I'm not what I have, what I achieve, or whether or not I'm in control. I am who God says I am through Jesus. I'm his beloved son, his beloved daughter, and with me, he is well pleased because it's your belonging that ultimately shapes your being. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this reminder this morning, for this reminder of who we are in you. And Lord, I confess that it's easy for me to lose sight of who I am It's really easy for me to have this belief that I am what I have, that I am what I achieve, that when I'm in control, then I'm significant. And you are continually inviting me into another story, into another narrative where who I truly am is found in you. I pray that would be true for all of us here this morning 
that we would find our rest and our security and our significance in the love that you have for us in nothing else. Amen.